And that's not because I'm good, it's because my anesthesiologist is absolutely superb. So he knows all the hoops that we have to jump through in order to do it. So the first thing to access the lateral wall uh, is to let down the stay sutures and slacken the pericardium on the right side so that the right ventricle is not compressed. The second thing is to put a suction exposure device on the tip of the heart, on the apex of the heart, distract it up, and watch the pulmonary artery pressure as you're doing that. Simultaneous with that, the anesthesiologist has continued to volume load the patient so that we sure we have a full heart and not an empty heart, and has uh, turned, the, or turned the table toward me and put the head down to the table. <clears throat> the reason for the head down to the table is because it increases preload to the heart. The reason it's toward me is not that it helps hemodynamically, but he feels that I have to distract the heart less to see over the top if he's tilted it toward me. So we have to distract less to do that. So then once that's in place, then we make the judgment of whether the heart's going to tolerate it or not. And what we're more concerned about is the pulse pressure and not the absolute pressure. So for instance, a blood pressure of 45, 50, 55 does not necessarily concern me. So I watch what happens to that blood pressure over time, and I'll micro-manipulate the heart in one way or the other. The motion is all up toward the ceiling. And if you do that and stretch out the right ventricle, usually you can get the heart to tolerate it. We, as everybody else does, try to open the retractor as little as possible, but sometimes it is helpful to give a couple extra cranks on the retractor to get a little better exposure to the lateral wall. We assiduously avoid inotropes or pressors. Um, I think that when you do that, it always causes the heart to become more contractile and less stable and more difficult to do. So what we do is we do the micro adjustments and do all the small maneuvers to get it right without giving drugs before we go ahead and proceed with the anastomosis. We are pretty confident we're going to get through it before we ever start the anastomosis. If it's iffy at all, what we do is we put the heart back down, let the heart recover, and start all over again. Do you use beta blockers as the low, the best low? No, we do not use those no, at all. We did in the early days, but do not. We do use, use no pharmacologic adjuncts at all. Okay. And just to be clear, you are using pedicled remus skeletonized, or you're taking no, it as a free no, and then no, anastomosis to the LAD? No, so I try to do everything pedicled if I can. So I'll either put it to the right, uh, if it's a totally occluded right, or I'll put it through the transverse sinus to the circumflex. Sometimes what I'll do, especially in an elderly patient, I'll put the lima to the circumflex and I'll put the rema across the sternum to the LAD since I figure the chances of ever going back there is very small. So I try to do it uh, pedicled whenever possible. Uh, I just don't like doing that extra anastomosis and making a T-graft of a rema off a lima. But I will do it on occasion. Skeletonizing gets a lot of extra length, doesn't it? It gets a lot of extra length, and, and it's, it's a aesthetically more pleasing operation. Yeah. And uh, what's your views on endarterectomies, those most horrific of vessels that are calcified? Do you leave I them? Think, or do you... I think it's the most horrific of operations, too. <laughs> so I never do endarterectomies. I do endarterectomies every time I use a stent. I mean, a, a shunt. I mean, I'm that again. Yeah. I use endarterectomies every time I use a shunt, yeah. which is By never. Accident. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that's an excellent insight into it. Just, just we've, we've done our anastomoses, we're closing the chest. Those high BMI patients with a BEMA, do you have any good tips of keeping that chest closed? So I, I don't go through a whole lot of the fancy maneuvers for closing the chest. I use four figure of eight wires on virtually everybody. In the obese patients uh, and in the elderly frail patients in which they're, they're very osteoporotic, uh, what I do is I actually put the wires through uh, the sternum right at the costal cartilages or through actually the costal cartilage itself so I'm not going in the inner space so there's not that tension on the thinnest part of the sternum between the inner spaces at all. I also use uh, small uh, size 19 Blake drains. Uh, I don't use uh, routine chest tubes and then we extubate everybody immediately in the operating room. Okay, 
Well, that's uh, been a fantastic insight. I just had a few small questions. I, I can't resist uh, a principal investigator of this Sintat study just asking what impact that had on your practice. So, you know, it, it's always hard to answer that. There's so many different um, influences that determine um, uh, how patients get to surgery, why patients get to surgery. So it's hard to say what the direct coattail effect it has been of syntax. What I would say, if anything, uh, it has caused the relationship with cardiologists in the hospital to change. As part of doing the syntax trial, uh, there had to be a heart team, and a heart team is a surgeon and a cardiologist together that both evaluates the films together and say whether both can revascularize or not. So what this does is it gets me involved with the decision-making process much more than it ever happened. So uh, the, the, the real benefit of Syntax was the partnership between cardiologist and surgeon making the decision together in a complex patient. In other words, a patient with three-vessel disease uh, and perhaps some comorbidities as to which would be best. And the conversation goes something like, what can you do here? What can you do here? What, you know, do you feel better about this? Do you feel worse about this? And, and very often, I will be trying to push the cardiologist to do uh, PCI, and, I'll try to be, and they'll try to be pushing me to do surgery. Mm -hmm. Th those are the difficult patients. And do you do these in formal meetings, or is this in the corridor? No, it's kind of ad hoc. Uh, mm -hmm. It's whenever a patient's in the cath lab. And so, but, uh, you know, I make the extra effort to be responsive to them, and they make the extra effort to accommodate my schedule, so. Okay, well, that's been a fantastic insight into, into the way you do coronary bypass graftings. Uh, and I'd just like to say thank you very much for this interview for CTSnet. Well, thank you very much, Joel, for asking me to do it. It's been